If you have your Bibles there, turn to 1 Peter 3. We're going to do the second part of what we started last week, which I entitled, Why Do I Submit? We're going to do verses 10 through 12 specifically. We did 8 and 9 last week, and we'll look at 10 through 12 this week. You know, we've already kind of mentioned it a little bit this morning. We have, we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? Amen? I mean, we have so much to be thankful for. I was thinking this week <clears throat> about traditions. I, I think traditions are important. Do you agree? I think family traditions and things are important. They, they mean a lot. They make things mean so much more to us, and they, and they kind of help um, spotlight and remind you how blessed we are. And it is all leading toward being thankful. You know, I started thinking about all the things that I kind of associate with Thanksgiving. You know, I think about doing family stuff together. Uh, I think about getting to watch football. There's so much football on the whole week. That's, that's one step away from heaven as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and, and, I, and I think <clears throat> a big part of Thanksgiving is also, and again, we're so blessed, it's a lot of eating. A lot of food. We live in a place where, I mean, think about how many of you this Thursday, or at least sometime, because maybe you're like me and our family has grown so much, we have multiple Thanksgiving, you know, celebrations. Uh, and, and every one of them has food everywhere. How many, how many of you have celebrations like that, where there is food everywhere? I was just at one last night at my sister's house. There was food everywhere. We had, we had Chinese food. We had, uh, what all did we have? We had Italian food. We had Mexican food. We, we had, uh, my sister made a pie that I'm pretty sure is going to be served in heaven at some point. <laughs> we had peanut butter and chocolate and just a million calories and very good. And so then in the middle of thinking about, I was just, to be honest, I'm teasing with you, but I was seriously thinking about just how much I am blessed because we are truly blessed. Amen. Amen. And then my friend Kulan sent me this, this poem, and I want to share it with you. Please feel free to laugh. Are you ready? <clears throat> it is entitled, I Ate Too Much. <laughs> I ate too much turkey. I ate too much corn. I ate too much pudding and pie. I'm stuffed up with muffins and much too much stuffing. I'm probably going to die. <laughs> I piled up my plate and I ate and I ate, but I wish I had known when to say stop. For I'm crammed with yams, sauces, gravies, and jams that my buttons are starting to pop. <laughs> I'm full of tomatoes and french fried potatoes. My stomach is swollen and sore, but there's still some dessert so I guess it won't hurt if I eat just a little bit more. <laughs> Amen, right? You've got to make sure you leave room for dessert. If I could give you some of my own wisdom, start with dessert. Hey, you only live once, baby. Turkey's good. Listen, turkey is good warmed up later. Dessert, start with dessert. Okay, that's not biblical. That's just from the book of Lincoln. You know, do what you want with that. All right. Would you stand with me? We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 3. If I find my marker here, and we're just going to read the verses 10 through 12, but the sermon is 8 through 12. It all goes together, of course, more than just these five verses. The whole context goes together back to chapter 2. But <clears throat> 10 through 12, now if you look at your verses there, it might be italicized or the writing might be a little different. Is it like that in your Bible? Because Peter is quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting Psalms chapter 34. And he says, For let him who means to love life and see good days, any of you want to love life and see good days? Refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. You want to have a good life? Watch your mouth. If I could be like my father, you want to have a good life? Shut your trap. 
Hey, a lot of wisdom in there, amen? Verse 11, and let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Every once in a while I tell you this, you do not want to hear it said, the face of the Lord is against you. Amen? That's some serious stuff. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for laughter. That's one of the things I'm so thankful for in my life, Lord. It, it helps relieve and release so much, and I thank you for that. And I also thank you for times like this where it's time to get serious and really study your word. So I thank you for what you've taught us here, and I pray that what we're going to talk about right now will be specifically applied to every person sitting here, whether they're a teenager or whether they're a, a senior. Lord, I just pray that every single one of us will be able to take what your word says and maybe even, myself included, feel a little convicted about maybe how we've behaved, how we've talked, how we've acted, how we've taken things for granted. Lord, it's so easy just to use Thanksgiving and say we're thankful and watch a ball game and eat together and then kind of the week after forget everything we talked about. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll use this time to speak to us about how we need to be more like you every day. Help us, as we've been talking about, Lord, to submit to your lead in our lives. For it's in your very precious name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Maybe seat it. <clears throat> well, last week we got through the first two verses. Remember, the title of this is, Why Do I Submit? It was the third part in a section of scripture talking about submission. Talking about how that's a, a dirty word in America today, but really it should be a beautiful word because we can't have our best life without submitting to God completely. Amen? You can't have your best life without Christ, and you can't have your best life in Christ without submitting to Him completely. And how many Christians bang their heads against the wall, so to speak, they just, they work against themselves because they say they're Christians, but they don't want to submit, they want to do it their way. They want to do it their way and not submit to God's way. And so it was a three-part kind of context, uh, the scripture, this, this section of, of scripture, and it, and it was, when do I submit, to whom do I submit, and, and why do I submit? And last week, we got ourselves through just at least the first two sections where we talked about a couple points, and they're, they're important points, and I want to make sure if I can find where I put them. There they are. Talks about, we just said, hey, remember, in submitting to Christ, we've got to have the same mindset. This is the whole, why do I submit, right? Why is it so important to submit practically to us? Verse 8 said, well, because as a church, we need to understand that while we all have the same goal, that's to, hopefully we have the same goal, that's to lead people to Jesus, amen? And then those that are led to Jesus become more like him, discipled, you know, become more sanctified, more like Jesus, Okay. While that's true, we don't all have the same path to get there. We have different talents, we have different strengths, we have different abilities. And if we don't submit to each other, think about how many of the talents, the gifts, how many of the tools that you have. God has put all these tools in a toolbox called Calvary Baptist Church. Every one of us is a tool, uh, not in the bad way. All right. Every one of, every one of us is a good tool. Okay, and, and we're a tool that God can use in doing his work. And I want you to think about if Calvary Baptist Church is going to be the most effective it can, it needs to have a lot of tools in that box, not just a hammer. There are some jobs a hammer gets it done. There are some jobs a hammer destroys, and it does exactly opposite what you want to get done. 
The other day I was trying to bang something, I can't remember what it was, but it was rusted and it was stuck together, and all I had was a cheap little pair of pliers. They were metal, I knew they were cheap, and so I had them and I took them and I was using them more like a knife, and I was just banging things, and I banged my knuckles a couple times. I got nothing accomplished. I hurt myself. I did not help the job. In fact, to be honest with you, I kind of scratched it up a little bit. And I thought, wow, there's a good thing to think about. I was thinking about the sermon. There's a good example. We need the right tool. Sometimes I'm not the right person for the job. You are the right person for the job. Amen? And so we need to submit to each other so that we can make use of all the gifts God has given us. That's why we submit. Verse 9 that we talked about last week. Now, remember, in verse 9, <laughs> it talked about, hey, listen, kindness to each other requires more than just being compassionate. It requires us serving each other. Why submit? Because I was put here to serve you. You were put here to serve me. We were put here to serve each other. And until you start submitting to that call, we can't be as effective as what we've been called to be. Amen? If the church thing, church group, church body, whatever you want to call us, if it's working like it should, as soon as a member in the church starts hurting, other people start picking up on it because we're submitting to each other, we're watching each other, we're looking at each other, we're, we're trying to stay, you know, Tuned in, it's my antennas, okay, not my horns, those are antennas. And I'm tuned in, and I see, and I, oh, man, he, he needs hurt. Oh, we got to help. Oh, so, hey, they need some. Hey, prayer, help, thought, talk, listen, whatever. We need to be tuned in. We need to serve each other. <sighs> May I say, we are raising a, and maybe it's because we are that way too. We are raising a group of kids, a generation of kids who have lost the ability, lost the desire to help others. They're not interested in that. They want to know how people exist to serve them. And before we start blaming the kids, they're taking it from our poor example. They're taking it from our poor example. And in the church, we've got to take that personal because God calls us to require, he, I mean, pardon me, he requires us to submit to each other. Now, that's where we got to last week. We've got to serve each other. And I'm going to tell you something. You know what serving other, each other is? You want to know the Lincoln word for it? It's a pain in the neck. Serving each other is rarely fun Rarely are you going to wake up and say, all right, I get to help sister so-and-so move today. All right, I get to help, you know, brother so-and-so mow his yard. All right, I get to go listen to brother so-and-so because he's hurting and he needs someone to hear me. He needs someone to hear him, you know. Rarely is that something by nature you like to do. Okay. So you got to get out there and you got to force yourself to do it. But I'm going to tell you something. Once you get in there and you do it, God blesses you for it. It's one of those things like exercise. You never wake up in the morning and say, all right, I get to go run three miles. You pee. But once you get into it, I'll tell you what, you, and those that exercise tell me this, they know it's true. Once you get into it, you get it done. It's a great feeling to know you got it accomplished. And it's that way in service when you serve each other. Okay, again, why do we submit? Because you know what? The reason why somebody else needs you right now, you're going to need somebody tomorrow. That's why we submit to each other. Then we come to verses 10 through 12. And Peter says, <clears throat> I couldn't say it better myself. And so he quotes the Old Testament. A uh, little side note, the best way to interpret Scripture is with other Scripture. Not Lincoln, not a, not a commentary. They may be good, they may be bad. People make mistakes. The, the one place you're never going to find mistakes is other scripture helping you understand what scripture means. Amen? 
And so he goes to, you know, Psalms chapter 34, verses 12 through 16. And he's just told us in 8 and 9 that we've got to conduct ourselves correctly. Remember, he's been talking to people who have been facing a lot of adversity. And he's saying, guys, you can't give up. In fact, you've got to submit. That's the way to handle this adversity in your life. Boy, that sounds counterculture, doesn't it? He says, you've got to submit to each other. You've got to submit to God in the face of this hostility. Any of you facing hostility lately? Any of you facing obstacles in your life that you don't deserve? Hmm. The way, he says, he gives a summary. He says the way that God wants you to handle that is, he looks and he says, how about verse 10? He says, and start of verse 10, you want to live a long, fulfilled life I think we'd all say we'd love to live a long, fulfilled life, a life full of God's blessings, right? He says, you want to do that? Then you must watch what you say and don't speak evil. If you have the outline from last week, don't speak evil of others and always speak the truth. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? That's the first place he went. Want to live a full life? Watch your mouth. Watch what you say. Control. We'll talk about that in a second, a little bit more in our life applications. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all. You know, I've said this before. Social media has made it kind of like programmed us that we think we have to comment. The world needs to know what I think about every single event. I'm going to tell you right now. The majority of the world couldn't care less what you think about the latest verdict. I, you know, I don't always have all the answers. And I bet we have disagreement about the recent verdict that came up this week. I'll tell you this. Things would have gone better if everybody wouldn't have to think they think they have to share what they think about that verdict. You know, what's the old expression? You know, don't share your two cents because, you know, you won't have any cents left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. You, you know what I'm saying. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Then he goes on to verse 11. We'll talk about that more in a second. And then he says, now, in addition to that, a way of, again, submitting, this is why you submit to God, is so that you can, verse 11, the start of it says, turn away from evil and do good. Now, <laughs> notice we all know that God wants us to do good. Amen? God wants us to do good. Notice what Peter says is the first step of doing good. Before you can do good, you've got to turn away from what is bad. You can't continue to do good if you don't stop doing what is bad. You can't submit to God completely if you only come to him and give him parts, you got to turn away from that junk and turn completely to him. The, the word there in Greek that Paul, that Peter, pardon me, uses, means, it means to steer clear of. It means a 180 degree turn. It means to completely avoid. If you've ever had trouble with an addiction, you know the last place you want to be is around other people who are socially doing whatever it is you have trouble with in the past. Right? A recovering alcoholic does not want to go spend Christmas Eve at the bar. Right? A recovering whatever, you need to steer clear. And I'm going to tell you, that means making some tough choices. That might mean deciding that you're not going to hang out with certain people anymore. You with me? That might mean that you can't be with certain people anymore. If you have a problem with truth, lying, your mouth, 
maybe you need to be careful about the people you hang out with. If they're a little too free with the tongue, then maybe you need to spend less time with them. Are you with me? you got to show some common sense. You know, it's amazing. I'll, I'll see kids at school. I'll see parents, and they're looking at their kids, and they're saying, man, I don't understand why they can't see this. I'm looking at it. It's so clear. I don't understand why they can't see this and make the right choice. And they're right. It should be clear. But as older people, we've lived through it, and we have a little better perspective, right? But lots of times, those same people can't make the exact same decision in their own lives. I don't understand why they can't just do a better job of, of doing their assignments early. And yet they're two weeks late paying their tuition. Ouch. I, I don't understand why they can't do a, I don't understand why they're lying to me all the time. And yet they just lied on their taxes. You set the example. It's the truth. And it says, he says, don't even come close to the thing. If you know something is wrong, don't even come close to it. I remember growing up, there was a kid that I thought, I was in junior high, and there was a kid that I thought was so cool. I, I'll just give you an example. I was a nerd with a capital N, okay? And I thought this kid was so cool. And I wanted to hang around with him so badly. And my dad put his foot down and said, absolutely not. And boy, I tell you what, I was just, oh, I thought such bad things about him. You are, I, you know, in my mind, I would never say this to him because, you know, you know, whack. I've never said this to him personally. But in my mind, I thought to myself, you know, horrible. What a horrible, you, you're judging and you're, you know, you're saying bad. You don't even know this person. You know, you're, ugly. this is bad. You are, ugh. I just thought so many, I don't even want to say some of the stuff that I thought about my dad because he said, no, you cannot go hang out with this person. Fast forward to like one of the first conversations I ever had on Facebook. So I don't know how long ago was that. When did Facebook come out? 10, 15 years? I don't know how, however many years ago it was. It was one of the very first conversations I had on Facebook as a, like a messenger thing. So I get a request, and it's this guy, and I gotta be, I'm, I'm a pastor already, I think. Yeah, I was already a pastor, and it, it was, he, he, he messaged me, and I was like, wow, I haven't heard that name in a long time. I haven't thought of that name in a long time, you know, fast forward 30 years, whatever it was. And he says, hey, <clears throat> I just saw that you're the pastor. I said, yeah, man, I am, and we're having a good conversation back and forth. And he said, you know, I need you to pray for me. So I'm about to go in for major cancer surgery. I'm like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. And, you know, you know how that conversation goes. And he writes back and he says something I'll never forget. He says, it's my own fault. Growing up in junior high and high school, all I did was mess around with drugs. And now it has eaten my body alive. And, of course, boom, I hear my dad's voice back from seventh grade. You are not going to his house. You hear me? Yeah, boy. All of a sudden, my dad, who, you know, I used to think was kind of a, you know, not so bright, got a little brighter. As we get older, they tend to get a little brighter. Right? Amen? He got a little smarter. I realized, he said, man, he, his mind as a parent, he had seen it. He could recognize it. And he said, you're not even going to come close to it. And if you want to hate me, you want to not like me, that's fine. But you're not coming close to it. We need to make that same decision in our lives. Some of you know. You're at the job, and you do a little flirting, and you say, ah, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. Because it can lead to something that destroys lives. You don't even mess with it. You stay completely away from it. Completely nowhere near it. You get away from it. The, in Proverbs, they talk, about, they talk about, hey, son, you see a woman with that bad reputation, 
And it's the same way, girl, you see, daughter, you see the same, you see a guy with that kind of reputation. You don't just kind of back off. What does is, what is, uh, Solomon say to do? Turn around and run. Amen? Not just, hey, back off and let him kind of go by you. No, turn around and sprint. That's wisdom. Stay away from it. Completely avoid evil. If you know something is wrong, stay away from it. Stay away from it. Don't even come close. And it says, and do good. That word do good means to perform or to get active. It's not a thought. It is something that you do with your hands. You get dirty. Service means getting dirty. Help, helping other people means sweat. It means time. It means inconvenience. Get out and do good for others. It costs you money. It costs you time. It costs you your convenience. It may even cost you your day off. Oh, poor baby, you're going to have to lose your day off. You know what? Suck it up and serve somebody else. Amen? There's your Thanksgiving good thought of the day. Suck it up and serve somebody else. It's not going to be easy. Hey, when Jesus served us on the cross, remind me, how much of that was easy? How much of that was convenient? How much of that was fun? None. But every single bit of it was necessary. Amen? Somebody needs your time. Somebody needs your day off. Somebody needs your hour. Somebody needs your listening ear. Whatever it is, serve them. Do it. Do good. Get away from the evil. Okay? Do something that is beneficial, your outline there, for others. Do something that's beneficial. And then, you know, the second part of verse 11, seek peace and pursue it. You know what? Peace, the outline there, peace is elusive. Peace is not something that you find easily. Amen? Yeah, you know, you got to work hard to ob obtain peace. Countries don't just get along. They have to work at it. Uh, husbands and wives, be careful how you look at each other and answer this question. Is it always easy just to get along? Everything is just, man, it just falls into place. Marriage is easy. You ever hear anybody say, marriage is easy? No, because we're all sinners. And living with someone else and, you know, putting someone else ahead of ourselves is hard. So if, that, if you love that person that much and that's hard, can you imagine how hard it's going to be to serve each other in a church? You don't have to go home with me. Poor Carla does. You don't. So that's going to be even harder for you. She sees a reason for putting up with my junk because she got to put up with me when she gets home. You can leave and not have to put up with me, and yet God says still, hey, love him in spite of his faults, and vice versa. Calls me to do the same. So that's what I'm saying. you got to pursue it. That pursue, that word pursue is a Greek word, um, for uh, persecute, like one would do, like, like, like you would be pursuing an enemy. It's the same like a, like a pursuit, like a police chase. You ever seen a police chase where the policeman is running after? Tyler, you've had to do this. You're running after, Tyler's running after in his, his former career. He's running after the bad guy and he says, you know, yeah. You know, I'm going to walk after this guy. Hopefully he slows down. Maybe he'll stop and wait for me. Doesn't work like that, does it? Right? You may be watching one of those car pursuits and you see the, the police all back off and you say, wow, they're giving up. No, they're not. There's a bird up in the sky watching them or something else. Trust me. These boneheads think they're getting away. They ain't getting away. They're boneheads. Okay? That's free. That's free of charge. That's not from the sermon. That's Lincoln free of charge. <laughs> they're boneheads. They think they're, get, they're not getting away. A pursuit means... That that policeman, that sheriff, that whomever, he is going to, she is going to put their own life on the line to catch that. And they are not going to stop until that person is caught. Amen? When was the last time you thanked a policeman or a sheriff or a fireman? When was the last time you stopped? 
and, and said thank you to one of them. They will not stop. They will give everything to catch that bad guy. You got to have that kind of intensity, right? My, my dog, oh, my dog. My dog, I'm pretty sure that dogs have um, OCD just like human beings. The reason I say this is because I got a puppy that's got OCD. Okay? The other day, we try to put him to bed, and it's time to take his toy away. So I take his toy off of the bed. He could sit there with daddy for a little while, but then he has to get in his cage and go to bed. That's our routine, okay? And so he, he, I take his toy, and I put it over here, and he sits up, and he just stares at that toy. <laughs> and he is locked on that toy. I said, Rocky, stop like a laser. He jumps down. He tries to paw at it. He tries to jump. He tries to paw. Rocky, get back up. Rocky, get back up. Laser. I don't know, 10, 15 minutes we go through this. I finally grab his collar, drag him, put him into bed. He barks, I, 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 barks, says, let's go to bed. I kid you not, 5, 5.30 in the morning, he wakes up. You want to know the first place he looks? It's like he's been dreaming about that stupid toy all night. Poof. Right back on that toy. I don't even know if he slept all night. I think he stood there and just stared where that toy was. You know, I wish Christians were that serious about pursuing godliness in their lives. But we're too easily like, eh, out of sight, out of mind. You know, the toy's gone. Oh, well, whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, God calls us to do something, and we should do everything we can to pursue it. Don't just give up. Don't say, well, you know, God's a forgiving God. He's going to, well, you know, something else will come along. Listen, I, I want to hear a big amen to this. God has given us a special divine purpose in each of our lives. And it's our job to pursue that until the day we go home to heaven. And I mean pursue it with all the passion we have. Everything we have. I, you know, I don't know what... I, I don't know what they're going to say about me when they have my funeral someday. I have feelings there's going to be a lot of laughing because there's going to be a lot of things to laugh at me about. But one thing I do not want said is that he would sit on his backside and do nothing. I want to make sure that they knew that while I made a lot of mistakes, I gave every single bit of everything I had to try to do what God wanted me to do. We got to. Our God-given purpose is that important. And here, when he's talking about peace, it, you know, you got to run after it. you got to try hard. We got, you, do you have a person in your life where you've got some issues with where there's a lack of peace there? You, you can try this whole out of sight, out of mind thing and think it's going to get better. But I think some of you will tell me, it doesn't get better over time. It just gets better worse. The Bible says you got to go to that person one-on-one, -on -one, or you got to forgive and let it go and move on. Not, you got to pretend like it didn't happen. That's nowhere in the Bible. You got to pursue it. You know, you ever had grandma tell you, you know, if you're looking for trouble, you're going to find it. If you're looking for trouble, you can find it. Amen? There, there's some kids I love them to death, and maybe it's because I recognize some of the same mistakes I made in my life, but man, I'm really worried about them, and I ask you to pray for them all the time. Pray for our youth, amen? Because if they continue to make the choices they are making, they are headed for some big trouble. Because you can see it. Because, you know, I've made some of those same mistakes. I've seen my friends make some of those same mistakes. If you're looking for trouble, you can find it. You have to diligently seek out peace. It doesn't happen. You get 50, 75 people together with all of our strengths and weaknesses. Peace is not just going to fall in place. You got to work at it. You're going to disagree with me. You're going to disagree with the person next to you. You're going to disagree with the person three rows back of you. You're going to disagree with each other. You're going to disagree with yourself sometimes. You got to work at that peace. Amen? You got to work at it. You got to work. Well, 
The last verse then says, okay, for the eyes of the Lord are toward you, they are upon you, or the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The Lord cannot take his eyes off the righteous. I want you to know something. <clears throat> when you are doing right, God sees it. When you are trying to do what's right, because sometimes what's doing, doing what's right is very hard, amen? Very hard. Especially in a country that really doesn't care about doing right. I mean, I love my country, but man, we are screwed up. We got some issues. And I love my country, but man, there's some things we got to change. And number one of which is to get back our eyes on Jesus. You need to understand something. The Lord sees you when you do right. And you might feel like that person who's doing wrong is getting blessed for it. I'm going to tell you something. This verse says God cannot keep his eyes off those who are trying to do what's right. Isn't that awesome? Ever, when you were a kid, did you ever do something right? And then your brother or sister did something wrong. Tony, don't answer this question. And, 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 and you, you know, mom and dad seemed to give them the, 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 the reward, you know, the credit for doing it. And you're like, wait a minute, I did that. God doesn't make mistakes. Parents aren't perfect. God is perfect. He sees. He knows. He's watching. Okay, you think Santa doesn't miss anything? God misses nothing. Amen. As a joke, but you can laugh. I know Thanksgiving hasn't happened yet. Don't worry. Okay? He sees you. He knows. He watches us carefully. It says his ears catch every cry of a righteous person. You ever been praying and you thought God is not listening? If you are doing what's right. Now, let me say this. If you're doing what's wrong... Don't expect God to work until you do what he's already told you to do. But once you have done that and you've done what's right, God hears. Trust me, he hears. He knows. Now, if you're sinning and you're doing something wrong, don't expect God to intervene until you fix what you know you need to fix. You got to do your part. Amen? Don't think you could do whatever and God's just going to work everything out. No. But once you've done what you can, God says he hears us. He sees us. He knows when you're doing what's right. He listens and he will not neglect you. Now, in just a couple minutes, i got to try to hit these practical applications. So let's go as fast as we possibly can here looking at these verses, okay? And they go back to some of the other verses that we talked about. When we hit last week, verse 8, practical application number one came from that. And that is that, listen, Peter is not saying, when he talked about unity, he is not saying that the carpet color matters. He, it doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. He's referring to the big things. When he's calling us to be unified, he's saying, listen, as a church body, we got to come together on the big major points of Christian doctrine and Christian practice. There's one way to heaven. Amen? There's one way to heaven. Lord's Supper you know, and baptism and the meaning of those, what they're for. Listen, whether we have drums and whether we have a piano, that's all, pra that's all preference. What songs are saying, that's all preference. Don't get wrapped up in that junk and don't let Satan discourage you by getting too focused on that junk that's not important. That's your preference. Amen? I teased you last week about, you know, different kinds of music. Some of you love the twang of country. Some of you, it makes your ears bleed. <laughs> and we should just laugh and enjoy that difference. Amen? I'm glad we all like different stuff. Ooh, can you imagine if it was 75 Lincolns in the church? That would be a scary place. No, no, we need other, other strengths, people. You guys have that I don't have. And I thank God for that. I thank God for my church family. Because they make up for all of my weaknesses. I thank God for you. 
And I thank God for that. Peter's talking about having an attitude of humility and being willingness to be open to what God is doing through our minor differences. Amen? He's using the differences of each other to try to bring out something better in you. I bet you, let me give you an example. I bet you, you married somebody who is, if you got married, I bet you, you married somebody who is a compliment of you. I know this. I would be dirt poor if I had not married a woman like my wife. I, I literally, money is, I, 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 I have no clue what, where, when, how, why. No clue. Oh, I can spend it. Other than that, I'm lost. You hear what I'm saying? God compliments each other. My weaknesses, and I hope I have some strengths that hopefully help some of her weaknesses. And, and hopefully together we make each other better. That's what the church body does. Amen? I, I, I challenge you. Instead of complaining about the differences of your church family, think about this week and this week of being thankful. How does that person's differences, who I, I, those, those things that I used to let get on my nerves, how do those actually make me better? Because they do. Maybe you're too stubborn to notice it, but they do make you better. Amen? 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 Number two, practical application came from that same verse toward the end of that verse. And it talked about humility. It was talking about humility. A humble spirit is the key to healing broken relationships. I have done, I don't know, in upwards of over 100 funerals. I was looking at my Pretty soon, I'm going to have to have a file cabinet for just my funerals because I like to keep those so I can go back and, and look at my words and what I've said and use those sometimes in reference and stuff. Uh, I've done well over 100 funerals, just about that many weddings too. And, and one thing I can always tell you is at funerals, there's a lot of regret. Regret for losing the opportunity to speak to or to correct things with that person that's gone and regret for relationships for people sitting in the same building for the same funeral. They both have regrets for the person who's gone, hopefully with the Lord, amen, prayerfully with the Lord. And they have regret and they'll express regret about what they've said and done or lost or uh, lost opportunities for the person that's gone but they won't do anything for the person that's sitting two rows away from them that they haven't talked to since 1997. This is not a spiritual word. This is a Lincoln word. That is just dumb. And it's sinful. And it's prideful. Amen? You want to fix those relationships. Now listen, I know there are some relationships that will not let themselves be fixed because they will not do what they need to do. You can only be your part of that relationship. But for your part, you must humble yourself to fix broken relationships. You say, what's that got to do with submission? I got to submit to Christ because sometimes, guess what? You know what? I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong. And either way, Neither matters when it comes to whether or not I want to fix that relationship. Do you want to fix the relationship or not? Then stop worrying about who's right and who's wrong and do what you can to fix it. And if they won't let you fix it, then you give it to the Lord and you can put your head on the pillow and sleep that night knowing you did what you could. But regret is all about the fact that you know you did not do what you could have to fix that relationship. And God works through relationships to bring people closer to Christ. He uses the people in my life to bring me closer to Christ. And so I need to do the best I can to make those relationships right, the best they can be, so that I can be my best for Jesus. Because I got a lot of faults, and you help fill those gaps in for me. 
Now, if your relationship with me is not good, there's a gap I can't fill. Are you with me? Submit. Some of us are just, forgive the expression, pig-headed. Stubborn. Head like a rock. We just don't want to give in. And we'd rather be miserable than humbling ourselves and fixing a relationship. Hmm. And I bet you if you think about the relationships that are good in your life, you can think back and realize there's times where you've had to submit to the other person and accept something that maybe you didn't want to, but because it was best for the relationship you did, and the relationship continued to grow. Yeah. That's part of a relationship. That's just part of those things. And God works through those relationships. In verse 7, he says, he begins with the word likewise. I want to say this before we close, and we're going to go over time. I apologize, but this is very important. And because I didn't give Pastor Frank a couple weeks to talk about his submission, this is very important. At the, at the start of verse 7, remember our verses, this section, were 8 through 12, right? Pastor Frank talked about 1 through 7. And people get... People get their feathers all ruffled, forgive the pun there, turkey feathers, get it? You get your feathers all ruffled sometimes, lots of times, sometimes ladies do, about the whole submission thing. But I want you to notice the word. After it talked about the lady submitting to her husband, only her husband, by the way, Pastor Frank made a good point about that, then it says to the men, likewise. Now, what does that word mean? He's starting to make a point to the men, and it says, likewise. That is huge, because that means that submission to your wife is just as much the man's responsibility as it is a woman's responsibility submitting to her husband. I just got done telling you that my wife has these strengths that I don't have. How dumb would I have to be to have been given a gift of a wife with these gifts that I don't have and then not use them? I mean, hello? <laughs> 80s movies, McFly, hello? <laughs> McFly, wake up! <laughs> men, men, submit to your wife in those areas where she has been gifted and you follow her lead in decisions. Just like the ladies are called to submit at those times where he's been gifted, vice versa. Yeah, likewise. See, that's one of the reasons why we don't need to look at that whole submission thing as a bad thing. Because at the end of the day, God is saying, submit to each other when you are submitting to Christ. Remember it said you don't have to submit when he's not following Christ. Remember how Pastor Frank made a big point about that? Because it's all about following, submitting, not following is not a good word, submitting to someone at times who has been led by the Holy Spirit and has been given that. God's not always giving me the answers. Sometimes I look around and say, uh, what do I do next? Sometimes God gives those answers to my wife. Sometimes he gives those answers to me. Why does he do it that way, Link? I don't know, I'm not God, but I think it's because he's teaching me to remember that I must always submit to him. It reminds me, when I get the good answers, I know doggone well it's coming from God, not me. Not this brain. It's coming from God. And there are other times when she gets them, and I know she's been given them from the Holy Spirit. We are, we are, we are to submit to the Holy Spirit. That's his whole context. You with me? That's a big thing. For time's sake, there was a lot of stuff there. But that, that humility, that's huge. You must submit. You must submit. And the last thing is about the tongue. I told you we'd come back to that. Because, boy, it just seems like we keep coming back to it, doesn't it? How many times in this study of 1 Peter has Peter come back to, and by the way, watch your mouth. And by the way, Watch your words. And by the way, be careful what you say. By the way, be careful what you are talking, who you're talking about. We were, listen, we were learning today in our study of Ecclesiastes. 
You know that little expression, a little birdie told me? <laughs> There's some verses in Ecclesiastes that talk about how, you know, even in your bedchamber, meaning to the person that you trust the very, very most, be careful, control what you say. Because even though I might, I said this in the Sunday school, even though I might, like with Carla and I, I might share, let's say I'm frustrated with Tyler. Tyler's getting picked on today. So let's say I'm, man, I am mad at Tyler. And so I think to myself, well, I got to be careful. I'm only going to talk to Carla about it. I'm only going to talk in private. And I'm just going to vent. You ever said that? I just got to vent. I, I want to be careful. I want you to be careful how you say that. Because maybe that's not coming from God. You ever thought about that? Well, I need to vent or I'm going to explode. Really? Who told you you need to vent? Who told you that? Did that come from the Holy Spirit or did that come from you? Because here's the thing. I know for a fact, if I tell Carla, if I complain about Tyler, which I never do, Tyler. But <laughs> if I complain to Carla about Tyler, I can tell you something right now. My wife will not say a word to another soul because that's the kind of godly person that I married. But it will affect her opinion of Tyler. It will hurt how she views him later. It will damage her relationship with him. So maybe I need to keep my mouth shut and take that to the Lord instead of venting. I don't know where you get this idea of venting. You're not an air compressor. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Maybe you need to go to the Holy Spirit. Maybe you need to go to the Bible with that instead of your pop psychology that probably has nothing to do with the Bible. There's a lot of stuff Christians say out there that's not Christian at all. God only helps those that help themselves. Where exactly is that in the Bible? Uh, I'm going to tell you, so I'm going to save you some time. Okay, you ready? Nowhere. It ain't there. Because I got news for you. You can't help yourself. I am helpless. You are helpless. Everything we have is because God gave it to us. I wouldn't have the next second if God didn't give it to me. So don't tell me about you helping yourself because you can't do nothing for yourself. It's all from God. You with me? Control your tongue. You want to have a happy life? Watch your mouth. You're not going to, there is no perfect secret formula for making everything go good in life because you are screwed up. This world is screwed up. People are screwed up. It's just a jacked up place. I mean, this you got sinner people in sinful world. We got, you know, everything else is wrong. Smog, this, that, whatever. I mean, you know, every time I turn around, everything I eat causes me cancer. Everything. The, when I grew up as a kid, I was told there was food, food groups. Now I'm told I'm not supposed to eat those because they're bad for me. So I, I have no idea. So I just eat donuts, you know. That's a joke. A joke. Although I do eat an occasional donut. Uh, only when Frank brings them to the office. It's Frank's fault. <laughs> People, let me tell you something. You want this secret to a happy life, a life where you have some joy, you have some. Okay, well, watch your mouth. Control what you say. I want you to think about some of the people as the musicians come forward here. We're going to close. I want you to think about some of the people who, are, who you think are wise in your life. I want you to just think. Think about in this time where we are thankful for our blessings. One of the things is God has put some great people in our lives to bless us. Amen? Amen. God has given us some great people in our lives. This is what I tell the kids all the time. I say, let me, let me tell you something. I don't have all the answers, but I know this. The kids that are successful, 
make good choices about who they hang out with. The kids that are not successful hang out with the kids that are constantly getting in trouble. Funny how that works. You know what I'm talking about. So what, you want, you want the best key I can give you for a, a life that has joy and, and that kind of stuff? <clears throat> Think about the people who are in your life who you look at as wise. I bet you they're very careful how they talk and what they say. When I think about that, some of the people in my life, I think about some of the people God's put in my life, they, uh, they don't talk a whole lot, to be honest with you. Some of the people in my life that I think are the wisest are the people that talk the least. You say, that doesn't speak well of you, Lincoln. You're always talking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, you know what? I am thankful for the people in my life that I can go to and get a perspective and I can just hear God just speak right to me through the very few words they use. Those are some wise people. I'm looking around. I see a few of you right now that God just really has blessed me in my life. You know, I think I'm going to do, this just popped in my head. This is free. I'm going to share it with you. Free of charge. I'm going to text some people today and tell them thank you for being those people in my life that bring quiet, steady wisdom to my life. That's a blessing. Hey, that's some good stuff, Lord. People, come on, hey. The Lord, the Holy Spirit just gave me that. That's some good stuff right there. Hey, watch what you say. You know, it's a big thing, like in education right now, is bullying. It's a big thing, right? Bullying. It's a big, big thing. And there's people on both sides of that discussion, right? You know, it's too much now. We've gone too far. Or there's just a lot of it, a lot of bullying. You know, <clears throat> a lot of the time, that could just be handled by teaching our kids to watch what they say. Just watch your mouth. You know, grandma used to tell me, you don't got something nice to say, don't say anything at all. A lot of that that comes out, comes out as bullying. It feels like bullying. And I think to myself, how much of that would just go away if we taught our kids better examples of ourselves and just watched what we say? Lots of times when a kid comes into the office, I'm the one that gets to do some of the discipline for him, a lot of the discipline. Not all of it. I got some great partners that do a lot of it too. But a lot of times when it's bad words or things that they've said, it's not original to their little growing minds. They are just copying what they heard a parent say. They're copying what they heard a movie say. They're copying what they heard another adult say. They're copying what they saw on TikTok or Instagram or Face Live book chat gram. Whatever talk, the latest. They're just copying what someone else has said. We've got to watch our mouths. As Christians, I think that's a big part of being thankful is just realizing that we get quiet enough during Thanksgiving and we just say, instead of complaining about stuff, we start saying thank you for stuff that we have. We have a lot to be thankful for, people. Not just during November all year long. We serve a risen Savior. He is in the world today. Remember that one? Man, that's enough to be thankful for right there. Got problems? Yes. Issues? Sin? Yes. But our God is bigger than those issues. How about we choose to talk about what God is doing good as a way of trying to bring people to Christ during this holiday season. Amen? If you want to come forward and pray, uh, you want to join, you want to be baptized, you just have something going on in your life. I don't know. Whatever it is, you want to come up. You come as we all sing.